If you look at ethics, for one, most people's sense of value and what's important to them and how to act comes from their religious tradition or from some philosophical perspective that they may have gained uh, through uh, humanistically, not necessarily religiously, but from their family or their community. So it's, it's natural, it seems to me, to have that as part of what you're doing in your work life because that's how you ultimately operate when the chips are down, when you're being asked to be honest, when you see things that are going on that are wrong. Um, your religion really is there uh, behind you, I think, or your spirituality. But in other ways, too, just to, to find times in the day when you can relax, when you can pull back from all the stress of work, spirituality, especially through meditation, prayer, other modalities like that, is a way for you to, again, find what's really important, find your essence in the midst of a very busy day. If you're constantly busy, if you're constantly going, 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 you really do, first of all, start making mistakes. You don't have perspective. You don't have the vision that you often need strategically to think about uh, your work and about the firm as a whole and where it fits uh, in, in industry and in society. And you get tired out. I think it's a back and forth. It's, as the Taoist tradition would say, a yin and yang. You want to go back from moments of quiet and stillness to times of being very busy and very productive. And you'll do better uh, in terms of integrating yourself as a whole being, but also you'll be doing better in your workplace. My parents used to tell me there's two things you should never talk about in public, especially over dinner with friends, and that's religion and politics. So I think that's right. People are worried about where religion may lead. It's very deep. It's very powerful. It can be very divisive. There's terrible things that are done in the name of religion and are currently being done in the name of religion. So there's lots of reasons to be leery of it. In the book that I wrote with Laura Nash uh, at Harvard Business School, we look at three kinds of religion, what we call espoused religion, catalytic religion, and foundational religion. And by espoused religion, we do mean the dogmas and the doctrines and the teachings of a particular tradition. And often those traditions, like with Christianity or with Islam, are proselytizing and converting traditions. And we think it's not appropriate to bring that to the workplace. But catalytic religion, by which we mean these methodologies of meditation and prayer and things that can be personally sustaining, and which you can do honestly in private. You know, you can close your own door, go out outside by yourself. You don't have to be seen doing that if that doesn't feel cool. And then there's foundational religion. And by that, we mean the great stories, sagas, um, rules that we all kind of agree with, like the golden rule or the Ten Commandments, um, those you can usually bring into the workplace and even note that they come from sources like uh, the Hebrew Bible or something and not have that be problematic for people. If you're going to do business globally, it really does behoove you to know what the religious tradition is uh, that's primary within that tradition, or, or several, tradi uh, several religious traditions may be there within that country. So if you're doing business in Egypt, it does behoove you to know something about Islam. If you're doing business in, in India, something about Hinduism and so on. Because so much of the business climate, in terms of its etiquette, it's the ethos, the cultural ethos of a, of a business, does depend on the underlying religion, which is often hidden from view. But if you know something about it, it'll, it'll help you a lot. One example of how somebody does bring their, their religion and their, their morality through their religion to work is Noah's Bagels, the CEO of that firm who also started Bread and Circus. It became part of Whole Foods, the natural food store. He insisted, because of his Jewish uh, uh, commitments, that the store close one day a week on the Sabbath and be completely closed, even though that would affect the business and their capability to have another day of selling bagels and uh, more employment for their employees, et cetera. And he also brought other kinds of ways of thinking to the work. 
he's referred to as a business mensch, as a you know an honest, uh, really caring, nurturing uh, employer, and that comes out of his Jewish understanding. Um, you look at somebody like um, Phil Jackson, the uh, coach of the uh, Lakers, the LA Lakers, and the Chicago Bulls basketball teams, and he brought a Zen Buddhist understanding to his coaching and has written a couple of books about that, uh, very, very explicit about how Buddhism affected the way he coached, how he brought his team together as a, as a unit, meditational techniques that he used for, and, and, and visualization techniques for his team. So you know, there's another example of, of somebody doing that. And staying with Buddhism for a moment, the CEO of LinkedIn here in Silicon Valley, Jeff Weiner, has written and spoken about the importance of Buddhism in his management. Compassionate management, he thinks, is the, the most important way to think about doing business. And he's been very affected by the Dalai Lama over the years. And so he tries to think of LinkedIn as a it's a company that's run on Buddhist principles, but not in a way that would be proselytizing or demanding that people become Buddhists. But ultimately, he would like to ha spread that notion of compassionate management worldwide. Mm -hmm.